welcome everyone to the September installment of the IPM Hour. Welcome back. I hope everybody had a uh, fruitful and productive summer. No pun intended, Lewis. Actually, that pun was intended. Um, so today our speaker is going to be Lewis Nottingham. Uh, Lewis is a research assistant professor of etymology at the Wenatchee Tree Fruit Research and Extension Center in Washington State. Uh, Lewis did his graduate work at uh, Virginia Tech working on control of insects among them harlequin bug and brown marmorated stink bug, some, you know, some of the bugs that are near and dear to all of our hearts, uh, but other bugs as well in uh, beans, peppers, collards, and other vegetables uh, with uh, Thomas Kuhar and uh, Ames Herbert. I, I know Ames pretty well. And then he postdoc in Washington with Betsy Beers working on Paracilla. He now heads up his own lab in Wenatchee and works on decision support tools, thresholds, and biological control for insect management in tree fruits, including pears and cherries. Uh, today, Lewis is going to talk about his USDA NIFA Crop Protection Pest Management ARDP funded project titled Expanding the IPM Toolbox for Sustainable Pear Production. And on a personal note, I just wanted to say that my wife is always telling me that artificial sweeteners are bad for my health. So I'm really hoping that in your talk, you might talk about that work of using one as an insecticide for Paracilla. All right, well, thank you for the introduction. And I'm, I'm sorry to let you and your wife down, but I will not be talking about erythritol today. It was not a part of this grant, um, but uh, it is interesting and I'd be glad to to talk about it at some other point. Sorry, sorry for the initial letdown right off the bat, but hopefully, hopefully I can make up for it here. So I'm gonna talk about this. Uh, this is a, a two year project um, uh, that is focused on pear um, IPM, uh, particularly on pear psylla, uh, but what comes with that is a lot of other insects as well, including mites and beneficials. So I'll jump right into it and kind of introduce, oh, sorry, I, I need to share my screen, don't I? Here's a, thought I was already sharing. Okay, hopefully everyone can, can see this now. Great. All right, so I'll jump right into it and uh, introduce the, the team of PIs. So I was the lead and then I was working with uh, Tiana DuPont, who is also at our station in Wenatchee and is a, uh, Horticultural Extension Specialist, and then um, Rick Hilton down in uh, Medford, Oregon at the uh, Southern Oregon uh, Experiment Station for Oregon State University. So I'll give you a little, um, get up to date on the, on the pear acreage, the commercial pear acreage in the United States. So the U.S. grows currently about 43,000 acres of pears, and most of that is done in Washington, Oregon. Uh, Washington is a little past Oregon. Uh, in terms of uh, the overall state. However, um, Oregon has Hood River, which is the, uh, the nation's largest uh, consolidated growing region. Um, whereas uh, Washington, we have a, one very large region, which is here in Wenatchee, uh, and then everything else is kind of spread around the state. But uh, for Oregon, most of the growing is either done in Hood River with 13K. Um, and then there's, uh, actually it's a little, I think it's a little less than that. Was estimating uh, it's probably more like eleven uh, for Hood River, and then there's another two thousand down in Medford, Oregon. So the problem that we experience uh, mainly revolves around Paracilla, especially in central Washington. Um, Paracilla has been a key economic pest and really just a, a a true headache for pear growers since the 1940s. There's never really been a good uh, strong control of this pest. Uh, especially not in uh, the, the large growing regions. Um, and one thing that makes it so challenging is that there's this need to conserve beneficial insects in order to keep the population suppressed later in the season. However, the insect comes out extremely early in the year and in areas where there's high pest pressure, it's well before natural enemies really get going. So you have to um, apply some, some level of management to control this thing, but you have to do so without going overboard um, or else you end up with these large uh, pest outbreaks at the end of the year. 
So unfortunately, um, we don't do such a great job of, of, making, of, of striking that balance. And instead we try to just spray our way out of the problem. Um, and, and Wenatchee is, seems to be the worst region in terms of this. Uh, and we also have the worst control. Uh, we're seeing people spraying on average about 15 times a year or a season, uh, which is costing growers $1,500 an acre on average. And just for comparison to the primary and most famous pest of apples, codling moth, um, that costs those growers roughly $200 to $300 an acre. So we're spending way more in pairs on management of parasilla. We're getting poor control um, and it's just a lower value crop overall. So it, it's, it's just, like I said, a complete headache. Um, and the problem is we're disrupting our biological control. So we just end up with these uncontrollable late season outbreaks. I'll talk a little bit more about that right now. Um, the need to conserve natural enemies uh, here we have a graph from some of the work that uh, the Tiana uh, and Tiana DuPont led up and that I, I helped with uh, on this paper that she recently recently published um, where they were evaluating pest and natural enemy populations in conventional IPM and organic orchards. Now conventional orchards are by far the majority of the orchards in the Wenatchee Valley and throughout the pear growing region of the US. And, and what you can see here is uh, the, the nymphs, uh, Paracilla nymphs, as we go through the season, it's all pretty even, despite pretty radically different spray schedules. And then towards the end of the season in conventional, uh, the nymph populations just absolutely explode. And here's a picture of what that can end up looking like, which is a completely defoliated pear orchard and a really massive overwintering parasilla population. So we're kind of dealing with the same problem the following year. Now, when we look at the natural enemies that were sampled in these orchards, it doesn't take uh, genius to recognize that there's a very significant difference going on here um, with our, our natural enemy populations. In our conventional orchards, there's almost no natural enemies throughout the whole season. And in our IPM and organic orchards, we have uh, uh, relatively much larger populations, which are keeping that late season Scylla outbreak in check. So why is this so hard to understand? I mean, this has actually been shown throughout the, the generations. Um, we know that uh, organic and soft managed plots have lower uh, parasilla populations, especially at the end of the season. Well, that's a big part of this project and, and future project, I think, is trying to understand uh, why we're not grasping this and how we can kind of get the message across. A big part of it is that there needs to be some treatment that happens early, but you have to do that without going overboard. And it's just a, it's tough to know exactly what to do. We don't have very specific recommendations, or at least we haven't um, in the past to give to growers. Um, there's a real lack of soft tools. We kind of have insecticides and that's about it. Uh, there is kale and clay, uh, but people don't seem to have full faith that these soft tools can work or faith that they'll promote natural enemies, which will give them suppression. Um, and there's just a very low tolerance for pre pest pressure. So once uh, crop advisors go into the fields and start to see some of these nymphs develop, they envision the future, and that is the picture on the right, which is these uh, really sticky shoots. Um, so instead of recognizing that, you know, a few scylla here and there actually are just food for natural enemies, they see what, what could happen and what often does happen in a situation where we don't have natural enemies. So our goals for the project, I'll go through these kind of quick, but one is to kind of to develop some soft tools, but also just uh, better understand how we can use the soft tools that we currently have. Um, and the three main ones that we're working with are particle films, which are like hail and clay, uh, stuff that's actually been used for generations uh, for parasilla management, reflective ground covers, which is a novel approach uh, and a behavioral disruptor, and then overhead tree washing or honeydew washing, which is just an insurance policy essentially it allows you to wash away that Scylla honeydew. Um, so you have a higher tolerance for parasilla. You don't have to 
worry about spraying every chance you get because you know that you have this non-insecticidal um, means to wash away the actual injurious part of the, the insect. So another goal is to better understand the effects of insecticides on our natural enemies. And our goal with this is to provide, be able to provide information about each insecticide that's commonly used in pairs and um, what effects it has on the natural enemies that are out there, because there are a lot of natural enemies in this system. And we want to look at this from two standpoints. We have acute mortality, which is generally easy to uh, measure for um, the more broad spectrum insecticides. However, some of the newer products that we have now uh, really aren't as harsh as the as um, the old school ones, and a lot of times the insects like earwigs are actually being exposed to the residue, so they're not getting this full dose. Um, so we also want to look at the sublethal effects uh, that wouldn't manifest in just a, a acute or a live or dead uh, mortality bioassay. And to do that, we're using this technology called EthoVision, which can track insect movement and behavior. And then we're also working on developing uh, these scorecards for, uh, that should be a three there for project goals, but a uh, scorecard for uh, Paracilla and its natural enemies. So this was part of uh, Tiana DuPont's work um, where uh, the, the goal is really to develop these thresholds so we know, have a certain number that growers and fieldmen can look at uh, or can have when they go into the field to know you know, when their pest pressure is at a level where it's going to cause injury, but also for natural enemies to understand uh, what level is a healthy level to have and to expect that you can get biological control. Then finally, uh, providing extension is a, a big part of this project is to make sure that we're actually uh, doing the work to get the word out. Um, and we have, uh, been performing study circles, uh, creating fact sheets, uh, contributing to an, a newsletter, uh, which grow, goes out through the WSU Extension Service, and then uh, making various website updates, uh, which I'll go into more detail in a little bit. But we'll start off with talking some about the methods, general methods, and general findings. So in order to make this timely, I've consolidated uh, the findings to what I, I, we we're finding is the most meaningful things that are consistent from year to year. Um, so to talk a little bit about particle films. So particle films are behavioral disruptors. Uh, they're just this white powder, these white powders that go on to, onto trees and it causes the pest insects to not be able to see the plant as well by changing the color and the amount of UV light and things like that that are being reflected. It's harder for the insects to grip the plant um, so there's that, it's like a barrier. And then also it's just kind of this inhospitable environment uh, where you know they land on it. It's not very pleasant. It's this particle that's getting all over their exoskeleton. They certainly don't want to lay their eggs somewhere where they're not likely to survive. Uh, kaolin clay or surround, it's kind of the mainstay product. And this has been used successfully in so many different crops, but uh, is actually developed for Paracilla specifically, which is kind of interesting. But since then, you know, this was back in the 90s, I believe, uh, when this was developed for Scylla, um, kind of some other, some other products have been uh, uh, tested and, and uh, growers are always interested in trying new things, especially if they're cheaper. So the sea light or diatomaceous earth is another product that you've probably heard of for use in home gardens. And then there's Microna, which is actually a nutrient uh, calcium carbonate, but there is some uh, original data showing that it has some effects on Paracil as well. And this is a really in a, uh, inexpensive product um, that growers are testing. So our goal is to test some of these different things and, and see how they stack up against each other. And again, we, we performed a lot of different experiments on this, and I'm just kind of going to go over the broad findings. But overall, uh, we did some uh, field, field trials and some greenhouse trials, and um, the results seem to show that actually pretty much all the particle films have some level of efficacy on Paracilla. Uh, you can see that eggs per leaf and young nymphs per leaf on the field trials and then also on 
uh, just some uh, 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 no choice bioassays in, in greenhouses. And overall, it seems that surround and sea light both are about equal to each other. Um, but the microna, actually, I was, I was hoping that it wouldn't be as, as, as uh, effective as it was, but it does seem to have some efficacy against Paracilla. However, it's not labeled for Paracilla use. So if growers do use it, they have to actually write it in as a nutrient, which it is allowed use for, but uh, technically they're not allowed to use it as an insecticide. So this is one of those things where we have to be pretty careful with how we um, uh, discuss this information and, and note that this was just experimental use trials and to show that you know if, if folks do spray the product for uh, nutrient use that th this is what could happen even though a lot of people are using it for other other purposes but really the surrounding the sea light seem to be the most effective products and those are the ones that are labeled for use against paracilla um, we also looked at natural enemies and uh, so this is a uh, these are some results from our, our uh, field trial. And this is just the uh, percent of total for each natural enemy group. And really overall, we didn't see any detectable suppression of natural enemies. There are a couple predators where yeah, maybe there is a little bit of a reduction here and there, but there was also often a reduction in Scylla. So we think that it was kind of commensurate with the, the difference in Scylla as well. Um, uh, however, we did see some interesting uh, secondary pest effects. So rust mites seem to be higher, um, not uh, statistically from the check, but from surround uh, in both years of our experiment. And then in the second year, two spotted spider mites seem to be higher in surround. There's a ton of variability there, um, which is something that's been reported. But overall, it's nothing too alarming. And we were using more of these products than uh, what would normally be used. I mean, the whole, the real goal is to use them alone and just see if we could cause an effect on natural enemies. And it, we really didn't see much. So overall, they're, they're pretty uh, soft and I, I don't think they're very high risk. So surround and sea light pretty much matched up nicely. Uh, Microna had a little bit of a lower um, effect, but it, it still did have some suppression. And then as far as non-target effects go, no real detectable effects on the natural enemies themselves. However, uh, uh, surround and microna both had a tendency to flare mites to a minor extent, I would say. So reflective ground covers is the next soft tool that we're going to discuss. And this was based on some um, uh, uh, pilot work that uh, I did when I first started my postdoc uh, looking at uh, these products on Paracilla on small trees. Uh, and we saw really good control of Scylla for uh, in an untreated situation on single tree plots. So we wanted to test this on commercial sites um, and actually get the products into the hands of the growers. So the two products we were looking at are Extende and Mylar. You see the pictures of both. One is more of a geotextile fabric uh, that goes through the center of the row and the other is um, a, a reflective polyethylene. Uh, that goes down the weed strip. So in the first year, this was 2020, uh, we tested this on uh, five commercial grower plots and each grower basically was a, a single rep um, for each uh, of the two treatments and, and a control. And the results weren't very good this year. Uh, we only had two growers where it looked like there was a bit of an effect but not really the effect, uh, only one of them really was the effect that we wanted to see, uh, which was a reduction in Scylla using the treatments compared to the control. Um, but part of the issue here is that one, it was a COVID year, so we didn't get our products until uh, later than expected due to some backups and shipping and things like that. I mean, this was right when COVID was taking off in March, so it was kind of a nightmare. And then there's also just some general growing pains with the, with the materials. As you can see in the bottom right picture, uh, there's some wind that had blown the material off. Um, so there's a lot of, this just isn't something that pear growers use ever. I mean, cherry growers and apple growers use some of these products, but they're not used in pears. So I don't think this first year was a particularly good look at it, but it was uh, a good start. And we actually had um, 
four out of five growers did not want to participate again the next year. They thought it was a pain and it wasn't worth it. Um, but one of our growers, Sam there, the guy that had the best control with it on the end, decided to work with us again the final year. And so to re we, we thought that this might work out to have similar size plots, uh, but all in one orchard to kind of reduce some of that variability as well uh, from grower to grower and just with the insect populations. And in, in this year, we got the product out um, early on time as we, as we hoped in March. And we actually saw some pretty decent um, uh, differences in terms of both, both products uh, on Paracilla, uh, the two reflective products. The, the other thing is that this was an organic plot. So, you know, with the conventional plots, they're already getting a good amount of suppression early with all of their broad spectrum materials. Uh, so there wasn't a lot of room for improvement with those conventional plots. So focusing on the organic, where there was a little more room for improvement early in the season, I think helped. Um, but still, the, the effects wasn't, they weren't tremendous. And I think part of that is because still, you know, even in organic, if you do a good job, if you get on, get out there and get your materials on early, especially the surround, which you can see in this plot, there's still not a ton of room um, to, to improve. So again, in terms of like measuring how useful these products could be, uh, I, I don't know. It's not, it's not the greatest test, I would say, because we have these other products going on on top of it. And if the growers are already getting decent suppression, there's just not a lot of room for improvement. So overall, we're hoping that we could show like that by adding these project products to, to growers um, are the, the um, the programs that they're already using that we would see a, a large suppression, but really uh, there needed to be, you know, some of the, I don't know, there just wasn't a lot of room for improvement in this early season time frame. And again, normally when we see the Scylla truly outbreak in most orchards is kind of towards the end of the season. So uh, that was a, a difficulty. Um, the products need to go out early, which obviously they didn't do the first year in order for them to work. Um, and then uh, uh, even the grower, Sam, who, who, who actually liked the prod products and, and was willing to work with us two years in a row, he said too that he wasn't sure that he would do it unless he was getting the products for free, which he was. So um, it's hard to say where this could go. I think overall, in order to really evaluate this, we'd need to get uh, more growers on board to really test it out and to kind of overcome some of these growing pains. Um, it's, it's just... It, it wasn't a very efficient product process uh, with most of the growers getting the products out there. And um, I think over a couple of years, like by the second year with Sam, he really knew what he was doing. Um, that could help a lot with overcoming some of this stuff. But uh, it's, it's a good start and we know that the products work. Will they replace insecticides? It's hard to say. Um, perhaps we can find other approaches though. So this, is, this uh, method is a little bit up in the air for now, I'd say. Um, in terms of uh, the third soft tool, honeydew washing, um, this is a really uh, good tool. I, I'm very excited by this because it's something that's kind of making a comeback and it was explored initially in the 80s with Everett Burtz and Bruner. But basically it's very simple. I mean, Scylla produce a lot of honeydew. It marks the fruit. If you can just wash that stuff away, then you know, the, your problem is, is greatly reduced. So we wanted to um, kind of talk to some of the growers that are already doing this and see what kind of uh, methods they're using and then start to get that information out there. So this was more of an extension objective that Tiana DuPont led. Um, and uh, basically what we were showing was letting, let it, working with, with different growers who are kind of pioneering these different techniques uh, in their orchards and, and kind of promoting those techniques because there is the, um, the desire for some folks to just go to a full overhead irrigation system, which isn't what we're promoting. We're looking for people to um, kind of adapt their current irrigation system into these other, into, or to this overhead washing system where they can just use it only for paracilla use. So they're still irrigating with their under tree um, irrigation. And then when they need to wash for paracilla, they can basically flip a, a switch or 
uh, flip a knob at the base of each tree or at the base of um, the row and, um, and, and convert the system to a honeydew washing system. And so we uh, have a website right now where we have our case studies located that you can check out. Um, and they're describing the different systems that are out there, but they range in um, costs from anywhere from $400 an acre to up to uh, closer to $1,000 an acre. But the growers are, have a lot of ingenuity with this kind of stuff and it's kind of uh, we just want to showcase that. So for non-target effects, this is a research objective. Uh, we were looking at uh, um, how the different insecticides that are commonly used in pairs are affecting all these different natural enemies that are really important to controlling pair scylla. As you can see, we have a lot of different natural enemies and a lot of different products to test. So in 2020, we mainly focused on um, uh, mortality assays. Um, these are easier to do. We were kind of limited in terms of our, our help. Um, so we couldn't get around to the not or to the sublethal assays. But we did get a lot of work done in terms of these uh, mortality assays. And we tested quite a few different insects. However, really limited by what we could collect in the field um, and what we could keep alive in the lab. And it was definitely a learning curve with some of these insects. So you can see Trechnites has a uh, this uh, obligate parasitoid of parasilla has pretty high mortality in the check, um, but most, most of them uh, look pretty good. And we got some good information on uh, different products that are commonly used. Um, and then this year uh, we've focused more because it takes so much time to collect the different insects and, 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 and with struggles of keeping them alive in the lab, we decided to focus more in on Two, two different insects, lady beetles and earwigs, which are easy to collect and easy to keep alive and really use those kind of as indicator species um, for how some of these different products um, affect the, the non-targets. Um, so from these, it's, this graph is, these graphs are way too hard to read for anyone to really get into it. But I think one thing that I, I do wanna point out is that if you look at a couple of these materials, there's a lot of difference in survival. So a sale and delegate are kind of two of these mid-level uh, risk materials. And you can see for earwigs, um, a sale, not, not, not too harsh on them, but for harmonia, you know, there's not a lot of survival. And then kind of the opposite with delegate. Um, so there is some nuance to, to these products, um, which I think is, is pretty interesting. And as we continue to, to look at some of these things, um, uh, it'd be nice to tease out some of those some of those factors. Um, as far as non-target effects go, with uh, for sublethal effects, uh, uh, we've been using the Ethovision, which is this behavioral uh, uh, tracking system. And here we have a, a particle film bioassay. We're looking at uh, the effects of kaolin on uh, earwigs' uh, desire to go to a food source. Uh, with the thought that you know particle films could possibly disrupt their behavior and make them not want to go and feed on paracilla. And we actually surprisingly didn't see much of a difference in this bioassay. Um, so this is just some of the work that we're starting. We're actually just really now getting started with the Ethovision. Um, it's a really finicky tool, I gotta say. And it's kind of like you need someone to devote a ton of time to learning how to use it. So we're really starting to do that now, but it's been a, a long process of, of getting this going, but I do think it's gonna be a pretty effective tool uh, that we're gonna to continue to use and try to continue to get funding for using in the future. So for conclusions for the non-target work and really for some of Tiana's work too, the disruption of biological control agents really may not be as straightforward as we kind of thought, where it's like you have these materials that are either high risk or not. There does seem to be some nuance and there's a lot of uh, kind of mid-level toxicity that we're seeing. So perhaps this idea that if you go out and you spray a delegate once, it may not actually be just like, well, you completely wrecked your uh, um, biological control for the year. And in fact, Normally seeing folks that are having disruption like that spraying these kind of materials up to 15 times a year. So 
you know, what would happen if you cut that back to one or two sprays per year um, of those more broad spectrum materials. But really, we just need to continue to do these tests. And some of the, the natural enemies that have been especially difficult to test are also the ones that are um, uh, particularly specialized to Paracilla, like Dariochorus and Trachnides. So uh, we're going to continue to, to do this work and try to um, develop better methods in the lab to test some of these, nat to keep, keep these natural enemies that are really important alive um, so that we can actually uh, evaluate these products on them. So in terms of the uh, scorecard, uh, this is again, uh, this is uh, Tiana DuPont's objective. Um, so she's building, was building upon her previous work where they're developing this, these scores or these thresholds for pests and natural enemies. And without getting too much in the weeds, she's, Tiana's really got a, a lot of statistical skills and, and um, she's done some pretty impressive uh, statistical work with a very large data set uh, from these different organic IPM and conventional orchards. But overall, uh, what, what she's starting to see, and I'll just go straight to the conclusions to summarize this, um, is that for in terms of parasol adults, really not a lot of change from some of the past work that Everett Burtz had done. Uh, about one, one adult per tray early in the season, two adults per tray later in the season is what you're looking for in terms of getting being towards a threshold. Psyllin nymphs, however, seem to be higher. Uh, they were able to tolerate more psyllin nymphs than previously expected, um, which was around 0.3. And I think it's closer to 0.9. Um, based on based on the last three years of data, and then for natural enemies, you know, our goal was really to develop to be able to go out and scout an orchard and say you either have enough or you don't have enough to expect biological control, and we just have not been able to to tease out a number that that really demonstrates that. And part of the problem is that those natural enemies often don't really show up in your samples until after the you would want to take action for the pest population. So really what we're kind of suggesting is that, you know, we seem to have a good idea of what these IPM programs are made of. And if you, if you, if you um, promote a true IPM program, you're going to have natural enemies. The data shows that they move around a lot more than we expect um, so if, if you're not spraying a ton of broad spectrum materials, the natural enemies are gonna be there and you can rely on them. You just kind of have to have faith and be brave as I'll talk about in a second um, from one of our other uh, seminar speakers that uh, is part of our extension objective. Um, but from these uh, soft programs, generally what we're seeing on average is about one natural enemy per tray, especially towards the end of the season um, when the natural enemies are really out there. So you can kind of use that uh, 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 retrospectively, I guess, um, uh, when you go back and look at was my was my spray program truly soft or not? If you're getting one natural enemy per, per tray, that's about what you want to see. So for extension, we um, wanted to have a lot of study circles, but with COVID in and out, um, we weren't really able to do that. Uh, however, we posted quite a few webinars. Uh, two at OSU and two at WSU, and one, like I mentioned before, this Be Brave, uh, we actually had a crop consultant from Belgium, an area where they grow a lot of pears, uh, talk about their pest management programs, and the reason why the, it's called Be Brave is because it's all about natural enemies and being brave not to spray when you, just because you think that the pest population is about to grow, know that that's actually just food for natural enemies, and if you, if you hold off on your sprays, the natural enemies will show up. They always do. It's just a little scary for a bit. Um, so uh, we also uh, uh, published our, our case studies on tree washing on our website. Uh, we've published 11 uh, newsletter articles uh, uh, talking about various elements of, of this project, of the research, and of the extension uh, that we've been doing. Um, and then we're currently working on developing a, a, an updated Paracilla fact sheet uh, that's gonna have specific recommendations and then uh, a new flip book with new pictures of natural enemies. All this is, is currently in development and we actually requested uh, 
no cost extension to, to get some of this, these last bits of work done. Uh, in terms of impacts, uh, it's pretty cool that I'm giving this talk now because just a couple of days ago in the September Good Fruit Grower magazine, uh, we were the centerpiece article for uh, highlighting all the work that we've been doing um, and not just uh, the research, but also um, the extension objectives. So like the tree washing studies, there's a nice piece on the growers that are doing some of these different tree washing methods. Um, in terms of the, uh, we, we, we've uh, conducted, like the nice thing about COVID is that we've been able to conduct some surveys over our Zoom meetings. Um, and of the 115 pear growers and crop advisors, 83% uh, have said that they've learned a good deal or a great deal uh, from the uh, work and extension and outreach that we've done. And then um, of 34 more recent, a more recent survey, 94% uh, um, have stated that they've actually implemented at least one of these practices. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, 47% of growers and 35% of crop consultants uh, plan to actually add additional methods based on the findings that we've done. So we, we do feel like these um, findings are getting out there, they're having an impact, um, and uh, we're pretty, we're pretty uh, happy with the, with the response. So going forward, next steps, where does this all go? Um, uh, one project that I'm currently um, working on, again with Tiana uh, DuPont, uh, is uh, uh, using the silophenology model that was developed uh, by Vince Jones to actually advise uh, spray decisions um, and putting those recommendations out through the decision aid system um, so that growers actually start to have a really specific plan for their IPM strategy. So it's not just telling people not to spray or not to spray certain materials. It's actually providing them materials so they can use and what timings to use them. Um, economic impacts are, are really tough and this is something that we need to do better. And, and the more that I discuss this with the industry, uh, they really want to know how this is gonna save them money um, they, they need to know that IPM is not just this, RP, uh, this arbitrary thing that we want them to do because it's you know, healthy and ecologically friendly. Um, it's actually economically beneficial. So kind of highlighting some of the short-term benefits like the lower spray costs, um, getting down from, from 15 to anywhere in the you know, six to eight spray category could save a ton of money. Uh, having cleaner fruit so they're getting better pack outs. Um, those are some of the short-term benefits. The longer-term benefits, having more fr attractive fruit um, promotes the pear industry as a, a whole. You get more return customers, the fruit becomes higher value. Um, and also it allows the growers and the research to focus on other things other than just pear silla, pear silla, pear silla, which is what we've been focusing on since the 40s and start looking into some of these more modern agricultural practices. This is part of the reason why you know, apples are so far ahead of us um, they've had good management of their pests uh, and they can focus on horticultural things. Um, and then uh, just like getting the information out there, it's very tough to reach growers. I mean, even in this modern age where we have so many modern tools, not everyone uses them and sometimes we're not always using them as well as or as good as we could. Um, so this is something that we still need to keep uh, improving on. Um, and then I have down here area-wide implementation. I think with the silophenology model and our understanding of IPM, we really just need to work on getting the word out there and getting it accepted and implemented on an area-wide um, basis, especially in Wenatchee, where we have a very uh, uh, cohesive unit of pear growers. So, you know, getting a large portion, if not all of the folks on board with these IPM strategies is really what's going to make, it's going to make it a lot easier um, to keep them going. Um, so with that, I'm going to wrap things up and just say thanks to everyone, first off, for listening. Uh, I really appreciate the funding. Uh, this was kind of the, the project that jump-started my um, uh, career into as a professor, uh, as an early career professional. Um, so I really appreciate it. Um, and then, uh, of course, the match funding from the Fresh and Process Pair Committee, and then everyone else. That's, that's helped me and been a part of the program and the growers and everything. So 
Um, be glad to take any questions if there are time. Hopefully, I didn't go too far over. Um, but thank you. No, you're fine, Lewis. Um, I've just been monitoring the chat to see if any questions have come in, and I haven't found any yet. So if anybody has any questions, you can. There are several ways you can ask a question, of course. You can plop something in the chat. You can raise your hand, uh, which I believe is one of the options. Uh, or you can simply unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, we do have a little bit of time, so um, if nobody else asks a question, I, I will ask one. And it won't be about using a artificial sweetener as an insecticide. You know, well, we can go down that road if you want. No problem. <laughs> Ah, here we go. So uh, our first question is from Len Coop, and he said, or he asks, what is the status of IPM labeling in pair these days? None that I know of. If someone can correct me if they know of something that I don't, but I don't think there is there, there's anything um, in terms of how, how someone can ID that they're using IPM techniques. And honestly, there, I don't see how there could be uh, because truly we haven't had a very specific IPM program to give growers um, ever. It's always been, you know, eliminating certain materials, but it's been very wishy-washy. Uh, so if we could develop that, maybe we could start to think about labeling for it. Uh, I think that would be a, a great way to, to promote it. If there was some benefit that they got but we're, we're trying to make it let it be known too that it's like well it's not just about getting a, a financial kickback uh, it'll actually make the the fruit better it'll save the money in terms of their pest management costs and and they'll have lower pest pressure to deal with it it really just is a sensible approach in pairs yeah uh, so Len just commented back, uh, and I probably won't pronounce this correctly, that Steemelt used to do this in the 1990s. Oh, okay. Uh, we do have two additional questions uh, with raised hands. Arash Rashid uh, has a question, and then Peter Ellsworth has a question. Arash, you want to go ahead and, oh, you are unmuted. Yeah, thanks, Louis. Um, great presentation. Um, it's, it's more of a, a discussion because... Uh, I'm just thinking a lot of orchards that you go to, even the fields that you go to, they uh, advise you not to, to, to speed or to go as slower. And, uh, and because of this interference that dust may have with natural enemies um, in, in a scenario similar, similar to uh, uh, Piracella. But um, my, my question is general, you, you observe some effects for the mites moving to the surroundings. Um, for the other natural enemies, I wonder if, the, the timing of sampling or, or what could have, um, or what have you done to control for such effects? Uh, because uh, I really don't know how long you expect them to last on the plant, but um, dust generally, um, uh, perhaps it would have a long-term effect if people keep driving and the environment's always like that. But what is the difference here that, uh, uh, you may not see an impact a lot on, on a lot of natural enemies or what could be done to minimize that impact if there is any. Sure. So I guess, so let me, let me make sure I got your question correct. You're, you're wondering, did we, how, how did we apply the materials and would that have maybe been why we didn't see a, a, an impact on natural enemies or in terms of when we were scouting as well? Is that what you're wondering? About? Right, right. And then, how, well, how was your? How do you think your sampling might have uh, impacted what you've seen? So both, yeah. Sure. So let, I'll just describe the way we performed the the field experiments. Um, so we started the the particle film sprays in June, uh, or I'm sorry, in May, and went through early June. So we're essentially trying to cover the second generation of Scylla immatures and then have one right before the third, one spray right before the third. Um, and then we sampled weekly throughout that period and then weekly all the way until the end of the season. So we were kind of right in the heart of 
of natural enemies. And we did catch a lot of natural enemies in our samples. However, the ones that we didn't see many of were the predatory mites, which are really what we would expect to control spider mites. So it's possible that, that our sampling resolution just wasn't high enough in terms of uh, the, the number of leaves we were counting um, to really uh, tease out those, those differences. That, that's a possibility, but I, you know, I'm just not sure. And then the and then pear rust mite, on the other hand, is really more of a, it's not as much of an induced pest as spider mites are. Uh, so it's, it, it's actually commonly an organic pest and not so much a, a conventional pest. So th it's really kind of a mystery <laughs> to me, honestly, the, what, what causes the, um, the dust situation in general, like to cause mite outbreaks often. Um, and in my research, I haven't, it seems like a lot of people have tried to test this and, and understand it better. And a lot of times it just doesn't tease out well in, in research. Uh, but I'd be interested if you, if you know of any good studies that have really kind of identified why it's an issue. I've always assumed it was because of disruption of natural enemies, but I haven't really been able to find a lot of good information on that. Okay. Um, Barash, did you have any follow-up or can I go ahead and call on Peter? Uh, no, no, I think, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, I sorry, guess. Sorry, that wasn't uh, a, a better conclusive answer. No, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's it a little was, bit of a uh, mystery. It was, uh, you could get, I guess, uh, dust is particularly uh, heavy on, on predatory mites and their ability to, to find their prey, I would guess. So perhaps that could, that could explain it. But yeah. Yeah, I forgot, I forgot about that one. Someone, I remember someone saying that, that you may be kicking up actually kicking up mites into the into the trees and there's that idea behind it too which is really cool but it wouldn't explain the scylla or i mean the i mean the particle films in this situation if they are causing a because they're it's coming out of an air blast sprayer unless it's because you're driving but our the orchard we did this on is there's like no dust in it because it's just a weedy mess it's a standard research orchard you know <laughs> it's it's a jungle basically but yeah thanks for the question Thank you, Peter. Yeah, Lewis, I came in late, so I didn't I didn't get all the introductory stuff and may have missed some of the methodology. But first thing is a comment, uh, and that is to say that if you're serious about understanding uh, the economics of your industry, we do have a signature program through the Western IPM Center for measuring uh, crop pest losses uh, and and assessment and impact assessment. And I lead that program and I'm happy to work with you or anybody else in the pear industry in the Pacific Northwest if they really want to uh, get started in measuring their industry because this is a common refrain from industry. They don't always know what the economic impact of almost any of their practices are. They know how much certain things cost, but they, they really, uh, a lot of industries don't look closely enough at themselves um, across the industry or longitudinally to really understand whether they're making progress or not. So I'd be happy to visit with you or others in the industry if you wanna, wanna get something like that started. Yeah, I, I definitely, thank you for that. I'd, I'd really be interested in it because it, it seems like such a huge task and, and very complicated given the insane number of variables that, that go into what can alter an economic outcome. Uh, so yeah, I, I would love to, to talk to you about that. Right. Um, we have worked with other orchard industries, so it's, it's, it's feasible to do. We've worked with the cherry industry, um, so it, it can be done. We've worked with other Pacific Northwest industries, so happy to visit with you more on that. The second point is a question, and I didn't catch it all, unfortunately, but it was about the washing. Uh, I'm guessing they're washing the trees as they go, uh, and with water, and of course, you know, I'm in a system, I work mainly in cotton, but other row crops and whiteflies are our principal pest and they're a honeydew producer. And we've gone through two decades of research on how to mitigate the stickiness and the sugars. Um, really a losing proposition in the end. Most of those research um, efforts have all failed. Uh, and at one time there was even interest in spraying water onto cotton and 
and so forth. Well, if you know anything about water and, uh, and microbial action and packing them in modules, you can create a fire hazard real quick. But um, I'm just wondering if you've looked at any of that literature and, and considered any of the additives rather than just water, there are a number of enzymes that were developed to help break down the sugars. Now, sometimes that's not ideal. It depends on what you're trying to do, um, but it may, uh, and I don't know enough about psyllid honeydew to know how similar or dissimilar it is from whitefly honeydew. Yeah. But uh, there are, were at the time, some commercially available enzymes that you could um, apply with the water and break down those sugars more easily. That's, uh, I'm really glad you brought that up. And that's a really interesting um, concept that we, so yes, <laughs> we, we often discuss um, mixing, um, normally it's some sort of a non-ionic surfactant or a soap in to help uh, mm -hmm. kind of wash the honeydew off better. And it wasn't until this year that I realized that we've been discussing this and, and I mean, it's probably the most common thing someone comes up to me afterwards and, and ask growers, especially, and they tell me about something they used in like the eighties that was like the best soap ever, like, you know, like some, some form of Tide. But uh, I, it wasn't until this year that I realized that we really don't have any products that I could find that non-ionic surfactants that you can put into an overhead wash uh, according to the labels. So we had been recommending Regulate uh, which is a, a safe for pears, non ionic surfactant. And we were doing it illegally, essentially, uh, until the WSDA called us out about it. It's kind of a gray area. So they weren't like mad, but they were like, yeah, you might want to be careful with that. So the enzymes, I'd be really interested to know what the enzymes are. And if, like, they do they have a label to be used as a insecticide? Because essentially they have to kind of fall under the insecticide category if they're being yeah exactly that's the face i make too uh, <laughs> they have to fall because they're used for an insect that's the the wsda's take on it that it's like this is how it has to be regulated you're using it for the excrement you should, yeah. look, uh, you should look up don hendrix with an x he was a superb carbohydrate chemist out of the usda ars unit in uh what was in Phoenix and later in, in Maricopa. He's retired, but I'm sure you can find his literature from probably 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, I don't know that those non-ionics are doing anything for you, honestly. Um, it's actually quite a thing to break down insect sugars and to not make them more sticky. You can actually make them stickier depending on how you, you break them down, so. It's, it's interesting. So we have done a, a research, we have a research component for this where we've used just water to wash the, the honeydew away. And maybe it's a uh, because of the way that Scylla honeydew is uh, composed, but it does, it washes off pretty easy. But you're right in the sense that if you don't use enough, you can kind of just spread it around. Yeah. And uh, you really have to, and what we're doing and what we, we've seen is that with the overhead washing um, we like to see that folks are using about 72 gallons per acre per minute and that runs for about three hours before you get thorough drip and then you have to run it for about another three hours to to fully so it's about a day's worth of washing but we're also trying to make sure that people don't overdo it because you can promote pathogens right. uh, such as sprinkler rot and if you do it too early fire blight yeah. um, things like that and, and eventually you create an environment that's just too humid and you can get other pest outbreaks as well so uh, we're trying to really make this a very strategic process basically that's only used in a specific way well and but you know honeydew serves a very important function in the ecology of, of these systems too so you have to be careful uh, it's an important cue for many of your predators that probably um, feed on uh, on psyllids or sustain them when there's low prey density. So, uh, you know, yeah. uniform washing at any time may not be a very good suggestion, right? Right. Like threshold for that too. I didn't. Maybe you talked about that earlier. I don't know. Yeah, we're working on developing a honeydew threshold to so because it's actually easier to for growers to go out and sample 
honeydew because they can actually see the bubbles uh, as opposed to seeing the nymphs themselves. But it's the, the predator, the ecology aspect is fascinating. And again, I'm glad you brought that up because there's this concept that, well, perhaps it's drawing in natural enemies and they're honing in on this. But there's also the contrary to that, which is that, well, are they going to eat the honeydew and fill up on the honeydew? Or could it possibly be protecting the Scylla from predators, making it more difficult for predatory mites to move around? For I mean, because it gets really sticky out there. I mean, are they just going to back off? Like, it's an earwig not going to crawl up the tree and get out to the leaves because it can't actually get to it. It has to crawl through this sticky mess. I, I don't know. We, I, I'm hoping that we can get some money to test that. Because <laughs> it's a real, it'd be really, or to have, you know, PhD, I think it'd be a great PhD project just to really understand the benefits and potential downfalls. Um, and actually some work was done recently, uh, I think it was out of Bill Snyder's lab when he was at WSU where they looked at that, but it's, it's pretty cool. They did see that the honeydew attracts some natural enemies, so. Okay. Thank Anything you. Anything else on that one, Peter? Questions. Oops. Oh, that's it. Okay. Uh, I think that's it for questions. So I just want to thank everybody for joining today and remind everyone that the next installment of the IPM hour will be on October 13th uh, at noon Pacific as well. And we already have one speaker lined up for that. Steve, you want to remind us who that speaker is? To remind myself who that speaker is? Or remind yourself? Uh, it's Mary Headley. He's going to talk about increasing IPM through community partnerships, also a Pacific Northwest um, focused presentation.